First of all, I would like to thank the Bernstein Foundation and the IMP for selecting my research for this award. It's indeed an honor to receive a, an award under a name of a big scientist like Max Bernstein. Um, so I'm really happy um, and honored for that. Yeah, so being at a PhD symposium, I think it's uh, very relevant to talk about this topic, which caused a bit of uh, stressful uh, moments for some PhD students who work in uh, developmental biology or generating mutants in general. So you spend like months or years trying to generate a mutant animal, and then bam, you don't see a phenotype. And then you start having these thoughts about your career, how many years do I still have in my PhD, and so on. So today I'm gonna tell you why does this happen often, and how can one circumvent this by de effectively designing mutant alleles that can show hidden phenotypes. So our interest in this phenomena came from the fact that a high percentage of generated mutant animals in different model organisms fail to show any obvious phenotype. And a number of mechanisms have been proposed, including redundancy, acquiring of uh, adaptive mutations in case of rapidly proliferating organisms like yeast, uh, rewiring of genetic networks or feedback loops, and finally what I'll be talking about today, which is genetic compensation or what we also call transcription adaptation. The interest started when the lab was studying an endothelial extracellular matrix gene known as EGFR7, where they were studying the endothelial extracellular matrix gene and knockdown of that gene using antisense morpholinos uh, or oligos caused uh, vascular defects in the development of the zebrafish embryos. However, once they degenerated the mutant animal for that gene, they were surprised to see that there was no obvious phenotype detected in such mutant compared to the wild type. Although they did the proper control experiments to confirm that the morpholino phenotype is not uh, an off-target effect. So uh, they performed transcriptome and proteome analysis and they were able to observe that the, the knockouts or the mutants, but not the morphins, tend to upregulate related genes. Here specifically, they found an upregulation of another family of uh, uh, extracellular matrix genes known as the emelins. You can see that they upregulated in the mutants, but not the morphins or not the knockdowns. And actually, these emelins can also partially rescue the knockdown phenotype. So this made them conclude that genetic compensation can be induced by deleterious mutations, but not gene knockdowns. So the underlying mechanism was yet unknown, and uh, I was interested to figure out the mechanism. So I started uh, by uh, screening a lot of mutants in the lab, uh, zebrafish and mouse, and I was able to observe that, uh, at least in zebrafish, we have the genome duplicated. Uh, mutations of uh, a paralog often lead to the upregulation uh, of the other paralog. So for example, here you can see that HBGF A mutants, they upregulate HBGF B, Vinklin A mutants, they upregulate Vinklin B, and so on. And we also found the same thing in mice uh, or mouse cells, uh, where for example, uh, knockouts of FIRM2 lead to upregulations of FIRM1, uh, beta actin knockouts lead to upregulation uh, of gamma actin, and so on. The first thing which I asked myself is, on what level is this transcription adaptation response triggered? And the first obvious thing to think about was, just protein feedback loops. You have uh, your protein uh, missing in a loop or a network, and this disrupts the network, leading to the upregulation of uh, those other genes. But I thought if this is the case, then if one were to rescue these mutants, if one were to provide them once again with the wild type RNA or protein, then you should expect these upregulation levels to be damped, dampened. However, this was not the case. So if we were to rescue these mutants, the upregulation levels stay maintained. So here you're looking, for example, at the VGFAA mutants, which upregulate normally the paralog VGFAB. And if we rescue them by injection of wild type uh, VGFA mRNA, the upregulation levels of VGFAB are still maintained. And we observe the same thing in uh, all of the models that we were studying. This brought us to think about two other levels of regulation. So we thought, could it be the DNA legion itself that triggers some kind of epigenetic changes uh, that are somehow inherited, leading to the upregulation of those genes? Or is it consequences of the presence of mutant mRNA molecules? To test first the DNA hypothesis, we thought if it's just the DNA legion, then if one were to look at any kind of mutation, even those that do not affect the RNA integrity or the protein integrity, like in-frame mutations, one should also expect this kind of adaptation response. However, this was not the case, so we uh, analyzed in-frame mutations for two different gene uh, models that we had, HBGFA delta-3 alleles, which do not affect RNA or protein integrity. They do not upregulate the paralog HBGFB, also, EGFL7 delta 3 alleles do not upregulate MLN uh, genes. So, we were left to think about consequences of presence of mutant mRNA molecules. Most of the mutations that we were studying were generated by CRISPR that leads to indels, and these indels cause frame shifts, which eventually lead to premature stop codons. And the cell has a machinery that can detect premature stop codons, and once it detects them, it uh, directs uh, the RNA for degradation. 
We observed uh, mRNA decay to be happening in all of the models that we were studying. Here I'm showing you some fish genes that we are studying. You can look at the HIF1 AB, for example, mutants. If, you, if we're analyzing the HIF1 AB uh, mutant transcript levels, you see that they are downregulated by 50% compared to wild type, and uh, similarly in most of the other models. So this made us think, can it be that the process of mutant mRNA degradation is what triggers the transcription adaptation response? And to answer this question, we asked ourselves another question. What would happen if we generate mutant alleles that fail to transcribe the gene? And thereby you still have a mutant because you don't have any mRNA produced, but you don't have any mutant mRNA degradation happening. So to do so, we either uh, deleted promoter regions of our genes of interest or generated full uh, gene locus uh, mutations uh, if the gene is relatively compact using two guide RNAs uh, and a Cas9. And uh, we were able to find that indeed our hypothesis is true. What we call RNA-less alleles, because they don't transcribe the mutant gene, fail to show a transcriptional adaptation response. For example, HBGFA full locus deletion mutants that obviously does not uh, transcribe HBGFA, they do not upregulate the paralog HBGFB. BGFA promoterless alleles that do not transcribe VGFAA, they do not upregulate VGFAB, and so on, and we found similar things in uh, cultured mouse cells. But what was even more interesting is that we were able to observe stronger phenotypes in those RNA-less alleles compared to the alleles that display mutant mRNA decay. Going back to the EGFL7 gene that I was talking about in the introduction, an indel allele or deletion of four nucleotides for that gene, um, the zebrafish larvae have normal vasculature development similar to the wild type. However, once we generate a full locus deletion mutant for that gene, you can see these uh, strong vascular defects that are similar to the Morpholino uh, phenotype. So a summary of what I told you so far, we found that uh, mutant zebrafish and cultured mouse cells transcriptionally upregulate related genes. Uh, this transcription upregulation is upstream of the protein function and that this is likely dependent on mutant mRNA degradation as we also observed that RNA-less alleles fail to show a uh, transcription adaptation response and display stronger phenotypes. At that stage, we're at this uh, model where we have a mutation that leads to a mutant transcript that's becoming degraded. But what we were missing is how do we go from degradation to induction of those uh, what we call adapting genes. And in the past decade, it has been um, becoming more obvious that RNA decay and gene expression are coupled, where a number of uh, studies, uh, including this one, have showed that uh, following mRNA decay, certain decay factors can translocate back to the nucleus to induce gene expression through promoting transcription initiation and elongation. So we thought, could this be happening as well in our case? And we thought if that's the case, how, how, how like we thought of a model where this would, these mRNA decay intermediates would act something like a guide RNA and a Cas9, where they would act as guides to bring these decay factors or other RNA binding proteins to specific loci in the genome and to induce the gene expression. And we thought if that's the case, then one should not only expect those one or two paralogs that we were studying to be upregulated, but also other genes that somehow share sequence similarity with the mutated genes uh, transcript. So to test this, we wanted to understand for a given gene, if we uh, look at genes that share in sequence similarity, how many of them would be upregulated? And we combined RNA-seq analysis of our cultured mouse cell models uh, of wild type versus mutant cells and combined it with a BLAST analysis trying to look for a given gene of gene sharing sequence similarity. And we were able to indeed observe that at least 50 to 60% here in red of gene sharing sequence similarity with the mutant gene RNA get upregulated uh, compared to a maximum of 10 to 20% in blue uh, of genes not sharing sequence similarity. And quite interestingly, most of those, of those similar genes were not upregulated in the alleles that do not display mutant mRNA decay. So uh, making us propose a model where following uh, uh, a mutation that causes mutant mRNA decay, you can have uh, these decay intermediates guiding some uh, transcription factors to induce the expression of uh, certain adapting uh, genes or functionally compensating genes. So before I close up, I want to say a couple of words about why we are so interested or excited about this finding in terms of human genetics. So uh, going through the literature, we we're able to observe that for a number of human genetic diseases, the mutations that are less likely to cause mutant mRNA decay tend to be more common than those that cause mRNA decay. Or in other words, for a number of diseases, you can find in-frame mutations being more likely than nonsense mutations. For example, in a study of Marfan syndrome, they found that an individuals with fibrin 1 mutation that lead to strong mutant mRNA decay have the mildest form of the disease than those with no mutant mRNA degradation. And similar findings were observed in beta thalassemia intermedium. 
Well, the current dogma in the field is that such observation can be due to those that do not display mRNA decay leading to formation or production of constitutively active or dominant negative protein, and thereby causing a stronger phenotype. We're quite excited to test the hypothesis that maybe those that have mRNA decay have an induction of a compensating gene and thereby milder phenotypes. So with this, I'd like to thank you again for your attention and uh, for the invitation. My lab, uh, the supervision from uh, Didier Senior, uh, my thesis advisory committee, uh, funding and collaborators, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.